So what if someone was born, you know, in a jungle somewhere? To be born upon fitrah suggests that we're born with some natural, a set of natural cognitive mm. capacities or yeah. abilities. Is the term reversion the right term then to use for your journey? And they say, no, no, brother, you didn't convert. You reverted. Thinking can get us into trouble. This is the Thinking Muslim podcast. It's the Thinking Muslim podcast. Modernity brings with it the promise that ultimate truth can come through reason, a reason that often excludes believers as outside the realm of thinking. Liberalism places religion in a non-reasoned bucket, which should be tolerated like all other irrational but ultimately comforting lifestyle choices. This is primarily why there is general animus against anyone that displays an over-exuberance towards belief systems. Such people are described as fundamentalists, unthinking and unable to make their own rational choices. My guest today is no stranger to these arguments. Jamie Turner is currently pursuing his doctoral research at the University of Birmingham looking at Ibn Taymiyyah and natural theology. Jamie Turner, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and jazakallah khair for joining us. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's great to have you with us. And I really appreciate your writings on this topic uh, that we're going to cover today on the fitra and whether we're hardwired to believe in a God and what does it really mean to have Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whether reason plays a part in that journey. So today I would like to explore how we come to that belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that idea of fitra. And I suppose some of the common arguments we find out there against a belief in a God. So let's start with the concept of fitra. Uh, how does Islam define human nature, Jamie? We know that there is an inbuilt capacity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to recognize him. So explain this idea of fitra to me. So, yeah, the idea of, of, of fitra um, in the Islamic tradition has different interpretations so different theologians have looked at fitra differently mm. the way that i look at fitra um is influenced by a medieval uh theologian ibn taymiyyah mm. um but the concept of fitra is first and foremost quranic so um in the 30th chapter in the 31st uh, of the quran portion of that verse uh, reads which basically denotes the idea that God fashioned or created human beings upon a certain nature. Mm. So um, in my mind, this is not particularly controversial. Uh, the idea that we as human beings have a basic nature that's common to us, uh, mm. that we share or participate in makes sense because um, how otherwise would we identify one another as fellow human de uh, fellow human beings if we didn't have uh, a common nature? Mm. And so that that's one uh, angle. Um, I, I mean, I'll, I'll approach it from that angle in a second. Yeah. But there's a, there's another element to this. Um, there's another verse in the Quran which Muslim theologians like Ibn Taymiyyah sometimes connect to uh, fitra, which is sometimes called the verse of the primordial covenant. Mm. So there is this verse in the Quran in the seventh chapter in the 172nd verse, um, and a portion of, uh, of, of that verse basically sets up this scenario where God is addressing all of human beings prior to them being created in the world. Mm. So we could think of that as them being in, in, in the form of their soul or in their immaterial right. state. Yeah. And, and God addresses human beings and, and says, Alestu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Mm. Um, to which humans reply, Qalu uh, bala shahidna. Mm. Um, they say, yes, we bear witness. Wow. So what's the relationship then between this idea that God created all of human beings upon a certain nature and then this idea of a, of a primordial covenant with mm. God? Well, the way that I see the relationship in following Ibn Taymiyyah is that basically we can we can look at fitra from from a cognitive point of view. Mm. So we can we can think of fitra as referring to um, our basic human nature with respect to our cognitive 
abilities or capacities such as reason, perception, memory, introspection, maybe intuition or a moral sense if we have one. Um, if we think about all human beings, generally speaking, they have these capacities just given their very nature or as we say, given their very fitra. Mm. Uh, and an additional capacity as per this primordial covenant is this basic theistic disposition that we have. So it's as if God has fashioned us upon a certain nature and the remnants of this primordial covenant remain within our human nature. So in addition to reason, perception, memory, and so on, we also have this basic theistic disposition, yeah. um, which is inbuilt within fitra, so to speak. And this again is, is, is interesting and not necessarily that controversial because uh, recently in the cognitive science of religion, um, thinkers have basically come to a consensus that, that, that theistic belief or belief in God is somehow natural uh, to human beings. Uh, and there are various different ways of, of spelling this out, but I'll just mention one, mm -hmm. one way. So um, some cognitive science religions uh, say that human beings in their more primitive state uh, during their evolutionary history, um, basically developed certain cognitive abilities to think, to reason, to perceive, and so on. And, and one of those abilities um, is to detect agency, to detect whether there's an agent, maybe a predator, maybe another human being, maybe their prey. Um, and they call this special ability a agency detection device. So we have this sort of inbuilt um, capacity. So if you imagine human beings, uh, again, in their more primitive state, maybe if they were to hear rustling in the bushes or a, a thud in the night or uh, maybe tracks on the ground or crop circles, human beings developed this ability to detect these mm. as um, instances of an agent being involved. And so formed uh, agency-based beliefs, mm. i.e. there's uh, an animal that's been around or that's uh, forthcoming or a human being. Um, and then these cognitive, sciences of, uh, these cognitive scientists of religion also say that there's this second ability which is called a theory of mind, which works in tandem with this agency detection device, which layers on the kind of uh, characteristics or attributes of this agent. So how does this connect to belief in God? Well, some thinkers say that where there are certain maybe uh, patterns in nature um, or instances of fortune or misfortune or coincidences and human beings have not been able to reasonably attribute a uh, physical natural agent in those instances, human beings have naturally attributed that to a kind of metaphysical or supernatural source. So I think that lends some credence to the idea of this primordial covenant and the idea that, yeah, there's a connection there. So if I've understood you right, you've got uh, these mental capacities, you've got the ability to reason and to think, your cognitive abilities as you yep. describe them. But on top of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hardwired within human beings, this human nature, this fitra, which brings them closer to a belief in a metaphysical being a belief in a, uh, in a, in a creator, in, in a being outside of man and the universe. Um, I wonder how much, so for example, I was sent a, 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 I don't know, a picture the other day of aliens, uh, places in the world where uh, you've had alien sightings mm -hmm. and uh, the majority of, of supernatural alien sightings of either in Europe or North America. So you don't get very many alien UFO sightings in Africa or in, you know, in Central Asia. Or in, is that because these are societies that have moved away from a belief in God, yet they've got this hardwired fitra which, which is urging them or which provokes them to, to believe in something that is supernatural in inverted commas. And so they're, they're replacing one, one belief, the correct belief, we would say, with an incorrect belief. Is, that, is, is fitra 
within that, if I got that analysis right? Yeah, potentially. So just to, to take a back step a minute, yeah. um, what I was really trying to articulate uh, a moment ago is that fitra is just our basic human nature. But ah. part of that human nature is our human cognitive nature. So the it refers to the various cognitive abilities that we have, as I said, reason, memory, perception, so on. Mm. And in my view, our, say, theistic disposition or faculty is just one, one of those many capacities that we have in virtue of our very nature. Yeah. Now, yeah, it may be the case that um, as human beings develop and form certain concepts, such as a concept of aliens or, mm. or other similar agents, that um, when they see patterns or instances of um, design or what looks like to be uh, an instance of an agent being involved in the world, um, the theory of mind, which does the filling out, which works to fill out the details as to what the nature of that agent is, mm. um, that could make reference to concepts that we've formed um, more recently, such as the concept of aliens and so right, on. Right. And so, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it is the case that uh, as the, the, the um, concept of God has, has uh, shifted away, um, maybe uh, other concepts have been brought in and uh, they're attributing instances of, of design or something to some of the creatures. Mm. Um, yeah. So, so again, to, just for clarification, the relationship then between, uh, between Fitra, or at least this aspect of Fitra, which is to, to have a propensity to, to come closer to a god or to believe in a god, and the other cognitive abilities like you know the ability to reason and to yeah. think and to see and to hear um the relationship is that um well what is the relationship do the, does uh, the, does fitra uh push you to think uh about the nature of uh this feeling you have towards a creator and then the thinking process takes over or is is the process far more intertwined yeah, so there's a couple of ways of thinking about it. One way would be to think about our nature as having this disposition to form our beliefs in yeah. God. Yes. And that disposition is manifest through the use of reason and perception and the like. So that there's not this separate faculty, ah, okay. not reason, perception, memory, intuition, plus theistic faculty. Ah. Maybe the disposition is connected to our general cognitive abilities. Yeah. Or one might think, no, actually we have a, a separate additional mm. uh, faculty. Um, I think the account that I was just uh, mentioning a moment ago from Cognitive Science of Religion yeah. um, suggests that, no, it's not as if we have this one theistic faculty, but that the disposition to believe in God um, comes out through different capacities working in tandem. Um, you know, we as Muslims needn't necessarily uh, agree with that, but that's just one account. So how different is that to uh, the Mu'tazila view, which I understand, I mean, from with my when I was researching this program, their view is that the fitra and the mind are one in the same. The fitra is really, what, this hadith that you mentioned in the ayah, the, the ayah, sorry, the that ayah, you yeah. mentioned, uh, they're really referencing the human mind um, the human mind has the ability to to bring someone to a creator, and that's what the fitra is. I mean, how different is your view to that Mu'tazila view? Yeah, so I think it, I think it is different. Mm. I mean, I think in what I said, you know, if we go back to the to the the first ayah which I mentioned, I mean, it seems to me reading that ayah and in again as I said, following Ibn Taymiyyah, yeah. um, that. God has fashioned human beings upon a particular nature. Mm. And it's part of that nature that we have certain cognitive capacities. Um, and so I'm, I wouldn't be equating fitra with the mind, but mm. with this basic human nature, uh -huh. which, um, you know, is endowed with certain cognitive abilities, uh, such as reason, perception, memory, and the like. I understand. So what's it? So um, there's a hadith uh, related yeah. by Abu Huraira where uh, we, famous hadith we always use it no mm. child is born 
but that he's upon a natural instinct. His parents make him a Jew or a Christian or a Magian. Um, um, so that hadith seems to point out that we are all born upon Islam or Fitra, and it's our parents who corrupt us, who change us, who make us into, uh, who take us away from the truth. Explain that hadith in relation to this whole discussion about fitra to me. Yeah, so that, that hadith is famous and it's always an important one when we're talking about fitra, of course. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the hadith is saying that every child is born upon fitra and as you said, it's the parents of the Jew, the, the Christian, the Zoroastrian hmm. that basically socialize this particular child into a certain uh, religious tradition. And so that suggests that although we have this basic nature and that nature might incline us toward islam in some sense now right. we have to be careful here and and, and be precise for instance ibn taymiyyah when he comments on this hadith he says that by islam um if we were to say that a child's born upon islam by islam he just means la ilaha illallah that there is to recognize that there is no god worthy of worship except the one true god yeah um but, so, I mean, what I would want to say about this, this hadith is that it suggests to me that there are certain limits or constraints on how we understand fitra. Mm. So, um, consider again that I was saying that uh, to be born upon fitra suggests that we're born with some natural, a set of natural cognitive mm. capacities or yeah. abilities. Yeah. Now, it seems to me that we are born with these capacities and they have a certain way that they're supposed to function and they incline us to form certain, certain beliefs. So, for instance, my perceptual faculties have been disposed to form beliefs in my immediate environment mm. that when I look, I will form a belief in a cup, in a tablet and uh, in, in you being in front of me and so on. Mm. Um, it would be very odd if I was forming um, beliefs that this is all a, a, an illusion or um, suppose I came to form the belief that none of this is real, the external world, you know, it's it's not real or that uh, I was created five minutes ago with uh, in, uh, with an implanted, implanted memories of events that never happened and so on. Hmm. That just doesn't seem to be the way that we ought to think right. uh, as per human beings. So... We have fitra, we have these capacities, and we're inclined to think in a certain way. But I think we have certain responsibilities as, as cognitive agents. And the environments that we're in, and this mm. comes back to that fitra, mm. uh, the hadith on fitra, the environment that we're in could um, impact our cognitive abilities. So can, just consider a simple example of a car. Right? A car works well in certain environments right it doesn't work well in snow very often people experience that mm. it doesn't work well underwater yeah. right but likewise our cognitive capacities don't work well in all environments consider that um if we just blacked out this room mm. uh, i wouldn't be reliable in forming beliefs about true beliefs about things in the room mm. or if i'm you know in a, a place where there's high altitude mm. and i have access to little oxygen or if i'm underwater and so on these are not conducive to me forming true beliefs, right. uh, perceptual beliefs, right? So we need to be in the right kind of environment for our cognitive capacities to work well, given their nature, given the way that they've been set up as per fitra. So if that works for perceptual faculties, maybe the same for our theistic capacity or disposition. Right. So maybe if we're in certain environments which are particularly, say, hostile, to theistic belief or try to stifle it um, or social groups in which conspiracies uh, are widespread. Maybe these epistemic environments will not be conducive for us to form true beliefs about, about God. Yeah. Um, from a Muslim point of view, a non-favorable or non-conducive epistemic environment for our um, theistic disposition might be a radically atheistic society, but it also might be um, a society in which a tradition proliferates other than Islam. Mm. Um, and then there's another aspect to this, which is what we do as cognitive agents. 
So going back to the car example, the car doesn't work well in certain environments, but it also doesn't work well if we do not use the car properly, if we can't drive well, for instance. Mm. It also seems to me that our cognitive capacities, which we have given our nature, given our fitrah, will not be good at getting us true beliefs if we don't adopt certain characteristics like being truth-seeking, being open-minded, um, being courageous enough to maybe challenge our beliefs or to consider the evidence or being firm enough in our belief to test it. Mm. If people just give up their beliefs willy-nilly, they, they haven't given it enough chance to see if it stands up to scrutiny. So there are also practices that perhaps we need to adopt to enable our theistic disposition to come through. I think in this context, um, say a desire to seek God sincerely, a, a kind of longing for God, yearning for God. Like Ibrahim alayhi salam or right. Exactly. Yeah. So um, the limits on fitra in the sense, if we're thinking of fitra as referring to this fitri theistic disposition, yes. the limits pertain to the, the environment and also what we do as agents. In, so in, hence in, the in hadith, life. if you're born, you're born upon fitra, but it's, so you're born with this theistic capacity, mm -hmm. but it's your parents who really socialize you into a particular faith. And that faith may be, according to us, according to Muslims, an incorrect faith. Right. Um, okay, so what if someone, I, I'm just trying to understand the limits of fitra a little bit more. So what if someone was born, you know, in a jungle somewhere, right? And, um, you know, so born in a state of nature, doesn't yeah. really have uh, people around him or her to socialize them into a particular faith. Is that person born, of course, according to the hadith, the person is born on fitra. So does that person have the ability just with those the capacities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them to come to a faith in God? Mm -hmm. Good question. It, it reminds me of this famous philosophical tale of uh, Hay ibn Yaqdhan, mm -hmm. written by Ibn Tufayl, uh, and it's about this. Ibn Tufayl is... Ibn Tufayl, yeah, he's a, an Andalusian philosopher. Oh. Um, and yeah, he was a, around a similar time to Ibn Rushd. Okay. And he, um, so he's a medieval philosopher. And he wrote this philosophical tale about a young boy who's basically born on a desert island and um, is raised amongst the animals mm -hmm. uh, in a state of nature. Mm. Uh, and yet in pondering on creation and so on and in developing an ability to interact with animals, developing language and then reason and so on, gets ultimately to a belief in, in a creator. Yeah. Now that's a pretty optimistic view from Ibn Tufayl. Yeah. Um, I'm not so sure that I'd be that optimistic. I think mm. that it's definitely true as per the hadith of Charles Bonham Fitra. It's also the case, as I said earlier, that cognitive scientists of religion um, are saying that humans even in their more primitive state have developing this agency detection device, right? So there's no reason to think that this particular person in the state of nature wouldn't have that kind of device. But at the same time, there does seem to be this need for revelation, this mm -hmm. need for guidance from God. Mm -hmm. um, if we are to form uh, true beliefs about God, uh, if we're to form them reliably, then we need a bit of help, uh, it seems to me. And and that's the point of, of God sending us prophets and sending us revelation um, so that we're getting these, these concepts from God and they're shaping the way that we think about him appropriately and, and, and reliably. So does the, rev the role of revelation, is it to shape our belief in a creator? Okay, yes, in the details, it, it certainly is. And we can't understand Allah and his attributes without the revelation. But back to fitra, doesn't fitra work separate to revelation in the sense that fitra uh, gives us the recognition or pushes us or desires, we desire to believe in a God through this invite. And that's what, what urges us to seek revelation. So is that, if I got the logic right there, that revelation comes to uh, to satisfy that urge which already exists within the human being and that urge is the fitra 
Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, Ibn Taymiyyah, for instance, uh, uh, he basically says that that revelation in the form of prophets and God's word comes to perfect fitra. Mm. So I think, I mean, the way that you put it, that we have this urge, yeah. and this basic disposition to recognize God, and then revelation comes to fulfill that, to match yeah. that, right. and to help us to form beliefs about God appropriately. And of course, uh, you know, our relationship to God is is not primarily cognitive. It is, um, you know, partly cognitive, but it's also existential uh, and to do with, uh, you know, worship as well. So, uh, you know, revelation comes um, to, you know, uh, push us towards uh, the praise and gratitude of God as well as yeah. thinking by and properly. Jamie, I want to go back to that hadith that we are born in a state of fitra and then our parents come along and they change us and make us okay, right. So, of course, today, I think a lot of Muslims interpret that to mean that we're born Muslims in the dini sense, right? We are Muslims. And someone like yourself who becomes a Muslim at the age of 17, I think it is, you know, as, as a teenager, you've returned back to your fitra, right? So you have reverted to Islam, right? So you were a Muslim, your parents or your environment, you were from Leeds, so you know, your shopping center and your environment made you whoever you were. Right. And at the age of 17, your fitra urged you to inquire more about your existence or gave you that, you know, that impression that you need to find out more. And then you used your mind and your faculties and you came to the correct true conclusion, which is Islam. So is the term reversion the right term then to use for your journey? Yeah, it's interesting. I like this question. I mean, it often happens to me that I speak to people for the first time, taxi drivers, mm. and I tell them that, you know, I converted to Islam or yeah. something. And they say, no, no, brother, you didn't convert. You reverted. Yes. And um, People are quite exercised about these two words. I they see. really are. Yeah. yeah, they're quite passionate about it. Yeah. But I, I often feel that the way in which muslims are using it is probably not quite right ah. so there's a sense in which it is right to say that we reverted to fitra for instance if we were an atheist or we belong to another religious tradition um that is antithetical to islam there's a sense in which we're reverting back to this original pristine nature fitra which inclines us to belief in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm -hmm. but that, I mean, I think as I mentioned earlier, say Ibn Taymiyyah, when he comments on this hadith, yeah. basically says that fitra refers to Islam in the sense of la ilaha in Allah, that there is no God except Allah. Mm. Um, that's a bit different from the deen of Islam, deen of Islam, mm. the, the religion itself. So it's not as if children were born with uh, beliefs in Islamic doctrines uh, and were adhering to a school of law or uh, recognizing certain uh, rituals as mm. obligatory upon them or something. Mm. It seems to me that it's more appropriate to think of us actually converting deen-wise, mm. right? That we left a particular way of life for another, a new one. Mm. Um, so revert to fitra, maybe convert to Islam though, I think. And so I think generally speaking, converts probably more uh, correct. Okay, that's, I think that makes a lot of sense. And that sits more comfortably with me, actually, in the way I understand fitra and understand Islam as a deen. But I know that, I note that there are some scholars who argue that fitra is a thicker concept. It's a bigger idea than just maybe Ibn Taymiyyah's version of fitra. Fitra inclines you not just towards a creator, but also inclines you towards the ahkam sharia. So, for example, if you see, I don't know, someone, a Muslim praying and you're a non-Muslim, your fitra is, is provoked. You, you see that to be a, a correct manifestation of your human nature. Or if you see, I don't know, the, uh, I don't know, let's find the payment of zakah, you know, uh, of charity, that inclines you towards Islam. I mean, is there anything... Mm. Within that understanding that you could, you could ac accommodate as a as a Taymian. Yeah, well, I, I mean, Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, idea of what concept of fitra is is thicker than what I've been saying. I ah. mean, there is more to it. Yeah. One of the things that Ibn Taymiyyah is quite 
clear about is that as per our fitra, we have a capacity to form certain moral judgments. So we have a moral sense of what's right and what's wrong, uh-huh. or what's good and what's bad. Yeah. So perhaps, for instance, the zakah example, giving in, in charity, say, um, paying our alms, that is recognized by us naturally as a praiseworthy and valuable and worthwhile thing to do, mm. a good thing. So um, maybe there is some relation there. Maybe uh, it um, resonates with our moral sense or intuition, which we have as per our fitra. Mm. So perhaps, yeah, we could, you know, draw that relationship in those instances. So someone could be inclined towards, I mean, I, so, you know, I, I, um, uh, I would like to ask you a little bit about your journey then, like, you became a Muslim at a, quite an early age, I would say, yep, you know, at 17 definitely. years old. So, you know, how, how, I'm sure everyone asks you, you this, but in relation to Fitra, how did you become a Muslim? Like, looking back, did the, the idea of Fitra play a part in that journey you had when mm-hmm. you came to Islam? I think it did. I yeah. think it did. I mean, I was raised in a, a typical British family, not religious. Mm. Um, and say me and my brother, for example, raised in the same home, very, very different. But I had this um, this yearning for for philosophical questions. Maybe why am I here? Where am I going? What's the point? Yeah. Even when I was no about one provoked s- that. You just had that in you. I think. Yeah. I mean, clearly, when I went to I mean, when I went to primary school, I learned about religion and learned about Christianity and other religions. Mm. But I seem to have this natural inclination to just ponder and wonder, even when I was about seven, like, yeah. what, what's the point of all this? Why do I exist? Yeah. And as I said, I wasn't rela- raised in a religious household, but I had, I, I had a copy of the Bible in my house, you know, um, even though it wasn't really to be there to be read. Mm. But, um, and I used to try and open it and have a look and I didn't understand what's it going on about with Gentiles and Pharisees and this, that and the other when I was very little. So it was a bit confusing. But I remember stumbling upon the uh, one of the verses which, which basically says, um, seek and you will find, knock and the, and the door will be open for you. Mm. And I think I was quite taken aback by that, that verse because I was thinking to myself, I want, I desire to know God. I want to have this relationship with God, and so that's the fitra. And then reading this biblical verse, it gave me some optimism. Maybe actually it's possible. Yeah. Maybe if I do seek, I will find. Um, yeah. What is the role of the mind in this whole process in arriving at a belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So we've talked about fitra, and we've said that we're inclined towards God. Uh, does the mind have any part to play in that journey to become a Muslim and a believer? Yeah, I mean, I think like by the, by the mind, do you mean re, be reason, reason, the fact of reason? Yeah, yeah. yeah. because I think, I think of the mind as just more generally encompassing like cognition, more generally, okay. like your ability to think. Okay. Uh, reason I would see as like a more specific faculty, right. like the ability to recognize logically self-evident truth that one had one is two or to form inferences right um and so on so sometimes people think when we talk about believing god by way of fitra yes. that reason necessarily takes a back seat a blind faith and, or yeah, something like that an emotional uh, experience mm-hmm. a spiritual experience brings you to god yeah, yeah but i i wouldn't look at it like that no. so i think so if we just consider again our other um, faculties. Mm-hmm. So like memory, mm-hmm. say, um, I could be having a conversation with you and I'm trying to get you to remember something. Okay. And, and I'd say, well, oh, do you remember when we met that time, you know, a few years ago and we we're at that restaurant and there was that guy in the corner, that funny looking man, or whatever we were talking about. Yeah. And, and you're struggling to remember it, but I'm trying to prompt you and maybe there's a particular detail that I mentioned, then you go, ah, yes, I remember now. Yes. That's memory. Perception, if I want, if we're out, maybe we're in, we're in the forest and we're, maybe we're, we're bird watching, bird spotting, I don't know if hmm. you're interested in that. I'm not saying I am, <laughs> but suppose we were, 
and I'm trying to help you see what I can see, I would try and draw your attention towards something, some feature in our external environment. So I'm yeah. prompting your perceptual faculties right. to form certain beliefs. Right. So I think that reason or rational reflection, mm. say pondering uh, the natural world, yeah. thinking about um, certain features of it, how it seems to be well put together or designed, mm. how it seems to be contingent, and, and other features that might act as a prompt for our fitri or uh, fitri, yeah, theistic disposition right. to come through. So there is that relationship there. Um, there is another aspect which is suppose we form a belief in God by way of fitra naturally, but we are um, we're faced with certain objections um, to our belief in God. Um, reason will come in there as well to uh, repel such objections, say, that we have to respond to them reasonably if we want to be reasonable in continuing to believe in God. Yeah. So I think those are two ways to think about how reason is still an important part of the process, even if you're believing by way of fitra. You know, you hear a lot uh, that, uh, and I know this is a, a debate within traditional Islam as to how one arrives at, at a belief in a creator. And there is a school that argues that reason is really integral to that and there's a school that argues it's mm. not so important for that but um from your perspective and maybe from ibn Taymiyyah's perspective um uh, does reason allow us because we we've said that fitra is quite limited it brings you to it prompts you it urges you it pushes you but then you need to solidify that that uh that conclusion and so does reason play a very important role in coming to a belief in God? Like, would you say that reason is the other half of that belief? Without reason, there is a there is a weakness in the iman, maybe. Mm. So there are a couple of things there. Um, so the first thing about, um, say, I mean, you said that, that, that fitra is limited to some extent. I mean... It is. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I've laid a bit too much emphasis on its limits because I still think that the capacity of, of fitra is, is, is quite uh, substantial. Um, I think, so going back again to this idea that we have been endowed with certain cognitive capacities as per our fitra, reason is one of those. Right. And so we might think that... Um, reason enables us to form certain beliefs and that when we utilize reason properly we will or we ought to even form certain beliefs mm. so i think as per our rational faculties we ought to believe that one and one equals two mm. there would be a mistake <laughs> clearly with our rational faculties if we were forming that the the conclusion that the, the, the uh, that it's three rather than two right so I would think that um, as per our nature, when we're using reason properly, we ought to believe in God. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, reason is, is connected to fitra in that sense, in that we have been created upon fitra with certain faculties and that endows that faculty with um, an inclination as to what sort of beliefs it ought to form. Mm. So that's the f first part of um, uh, an answer to the first part of the question. Maybe the the other aspect um, about the deficiency yeah. in in iman. Are we deficient? You know, if, if you know, I was born a Muslim. You know, in the sense I was born within a Muslim family, and so yeah. I grew up as a as a Muslim, and I was socialized into the faith. Like, is there a requirement for me to go through a process of reasoning my beliefs mm -hmm. in order for me to have? strong iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yeah, so that is an interesting question and it is a question that's present in classical theological really? discussions. Yeah. So you have, you know, different, there's a spectrum and, mm. and people are going one way or the other way or they're trying to find a center ground. So you have this concept um, that comes from the Kalam tradition, which is called... Um, or it's a principle, not a concept, wujub al nadar mm. which basically means the duty or obligation to use reason discursively, right. um, to reflect rationally 
and to form belief in God using reason. Right. And that is an obligation upon a Muslim according to this tradition. Mm. But what question that arises here is what constitutes nadar here? Like what would satisfy that obligation? Mm. So some in the tradition thought that it needs to be like a philosophical proof and maybe even uh, responses to objections to the proof and so on. It's quite oh, a high bar. Isn't that's it? a pretty high bar. Yeah. And hence, uh, I mean, I'm not saying this is a majority opinion, but this I think is a minority opinion. And hence, um, some theologians accused that minority of, of, of theologians of making mass tech fear, essentially. <laughs> Other um, theologians within the Kalam tradition thought that nadar is still necessary because they wanted to condemn taqlid or blindly following one's um, social environment. Mm. Um, because if we look at in the Quran, um, the uh, polytheists in Mecca are condemned because they want to follow the religion of their forefathers, exactly. right? Yeah. So some thought that nadar just means say, uh, reflecting upon nature and upon creation and thinking about it. Yeah. Um, and then there are even still others in the tradition who reject that principle and think actually that belief by way of testimony, if you're in the right testimonial tradition and you're following that testimonial line mm. from, from, the, from where you are down to the prophet, um, then, then that's okay. Um, and the, the sense in which it's okay or not okay also differs. So on one end, the extreme, they're saying, well, if you don't satisfy this principle, you're not really a, Mus a Muslim or maybe you're a Muslim, but not a Mu'min or a true believer. Mm. Others are saying, no, you're still a believer, but you're sinful or okay. something like that. Okay. There's still this duty. So, so those are some of the discussions. I mean, I think that, um, you know, requiring a philosophical proof, I think that's just... Um, wrong-headed mm. and I think it's unnecessary mm. um, so yeah I, I, I don't think that somebody's iman would be deficient because they don't know philosophy or they don't have a good philosophical argument and I yeah. think this um, this is where the idea of fitra comes back in so if we do have this basic theistic disposition and if this disposition is working well and reliably just as say my perceptual faculties or my memory when it's working well I can form true beliefs about about God mm. um, and so, you know, I think that might be all that's required. And does it matter where you are? I mean, if you live in a in a generally in an Islamic society, you, know, you lived in Kayasha here in in Bashukshah here, which is a right. Darul Islam probably for for many, right? So it's a very strong conservative environment, and everyone tends to be going to the mosque, and the mosques are full, and Islam is practiced, and there isn't very much going on which is against Islam yeah. in, in that community in Istanbul. Um, is it likely, or could you argue that the person living there isn't really going to have to, their faith isn't going to be tested yeah. in a conceptual way, yeah. like maybe someone living in Leeds or in London where, you know, all around us there are, there are conceptual intellectual arguments against the faith. And so we have to be a little bit more uh, aware of those arguments and maybe engage with those arguments in order to keep uh, within the parameters of faith. I mean, is there, a, is there an argument there about the, the yeah. context in which you live? Yeah, no, I, I think there is an argument in the sense that typically um, rationality being reasonable is is thought of as being person relative. Mm. So, um, you know, what might be rational for one person to believe might not be rational for another person to believe given their, um, given the evidence and background knowledge they have. So suppose somebody's, a uh, couple of detectives are trying to figure out who committed this particular crime and one detective has background knowledge pertaining to the facts the, the fingerprints on the murder weapon, CCTV footage, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It would be reasonable and rational for them on the basis of that evidence and background knowledge to form the belief that say it was, it was John who did yeah. it. Yeah. But the other detective who doesn't have that uh, evidence and background knowledge, well, yeah. it probably wouldn't be reasonable for them to, um, to conclude one way or another. Mm -hmm. So I think that Muslims in majority Muslim societies and say, people who are not exposed to philosophy and the like, 
they will just not have the, the, the philosophical acumen or tools to even understand, let alone address these objections. Mm. And I think, you know, there's this idea in moral philosophy that ought implies can. Like okay. you can, you're only obligated to do something if you can actually, if you can actually do it. You, you're not going to be hold morally accountable or responsible if something is beyond your control. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a Muslim grandmother living in Bashak Shahir yes. cannot be obligated to um, engage in philosophical reasoning because she can't. <laughs> she doesn't know how to do that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, that, that's a fair point. Ask you then about thinking, because thinking can get us into trouble. Now, at the risk of sounding like I'm a, I don't know, a Luddite. And this is the Thinking Muslim podcast. It's so the Thinking gotta, Muslim gotta podcast. But, you know, I, I'll give you a, a, a quick anecdote. You know, a friend of mine who, or a person I know who is a, a courier driver. You know, he's not yeah. a, he's, he's not someone who, yeah, he, he's lived in an Islamic environment, doesn't have any Iman problems. You know, he lives a good Muslim life. You know, he, he told me about a friend of his who was studying philosophy. And by studying philosophy, he had uh, had a crisis of faith. And, and now his Islam was, was pretty doubtful, right? And so he asked me to come in and speak to this friend of his. And, you know, after trying to reason with this person, it, it just became clear to me that he was obstinate. He, he didn't want to change his ways. And he had come to a, a view about the way he wanted to live his life. And that had impacted the way he thought about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Islam. Yeah. Now, maybe the, I drew the wrong conclusion from that. And the conclusion was, well, you know, this, here we go. There's a courier driver, you know, who, alhamdulillah, is successful. You know, he is someone yeah. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would, you know, has described as the one who is successful, right? You know, he, yeah. inshallah ta'ala, he's someone inshallah. who, who lives a good Islamic life. And yet you've got this person who's gone to university and he's thinking, uh, <laughs> but it's taken him off the path mm -hmm. of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the comment I made afterwards was that maybe sometimes thinking can be bad for us. Have I, is that comment wrong for me to me? You know, I mean, it was, it was the comment I made sooner as I left and I had yeah. to, I had to contemplate whether that was correct or not to say, but yeah, t tell me what, well, what's going the, on. There. The trouble with that, statement is of course you have to think to form that judgment true right so yeah. you you can't get you can't get around thinking um you know but i think to use a word yeah i think that you know we we, we have like say uh, this this philosophy student whatever um mm. you know when, when you when you study philosophy uh, you're supposed to study logic and you're supposed to study how to reason and so on um so yeah i mean Look, we have an ability and a capacity to reason, but it is a skill, yeah. uh, and skills need fine tuning, and and you know, it, just as other skills need fine tuning, you know, somebody who tries to ride a bicycle the first time probably not going to succeed. Somebody who tries to drive a car the first time probably not going to succeed. Mm -hmm. So, we have an ability to reason. That ability needs to be um, trained or fine tuned in some sense. Mm -hmm. Now. There's just there's one aspect of it which is um, training in the sense of developing an ability to reason logically. Mm. So that's going to help for you to do philosophy. But what about theology? So theology is the study of God. So what kind of training and background do we need to think about God properly? Um, maybe from our point of view, we need to consider god's revelation um what god has told us about himself mm. in his own words if we are to think about him properly so i think if somebody's not embedded within that framework say um then they're liable to make mistakes and mm. be unreliable in their theology in their thinking about god mm. um so yes if we don't have that um embeddedness within the framework um, our ability on on our own, all by ourselves, to get us to the truth um, might not always hit the mark. But isn't it scary? I mean, you know, you you uh, study philosophy. You're a philosopher, and you know, we know that large numbers of Muslims today are studying for social sciences and, and are going into philosophy and and these sorts of disciplines. Yet, uh, I do fear that 
uh, without, I don't know, limits is probably the wrong word, but some frameworks to think in, they are going to be sucked into cover, sucked mm-hmm, into mm-hmm, disbelief. Mm-hmm. I mean, is that a is that a, a warranted fear, or, you know, as yeah. someone who studies the uh, the discipline? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, when you enter into a philosophical setting, classroom <laughs> discussion, everything is up for grabs. Right. Your religion is not given some kind of special privilege as it would be when you're in a Islamic seminary or, or something. So, you know, everything's up for grabs and the question of whether God exists or whether Islam is true is up for grabs too. So clearly um, that could lead people to make errors yeah. uh, and come up with conclusions which do lead them away um, from God if they don't also have this embeddedness within the tradition. So I think this is what I was getting at. Yeah. That if we want to get our theology straight, um, it's not likely that we're going to do it just all on our own, uh, thinking and speculating and doing armchair philosophy. Mm. But we need some guidance, and hence God sent us the Quran. And so, if we don't have that embeddedness um, within that um, Quranic framework, then yeah, I think we will will be led to uh, strain in some sense. Yeah. Do you think that maybe in, in the summer holidays prior to going to university, you know? We should think about having courses, you know, led by some people like yourself, where you establish some of the, the frameworks that a Muslim student needs to develop in order to approach these social sciences. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you think that's a good idea? No, I think it's an excellent idea. Yeah. yeah. I don't know whether I'd be the one to, to go ahead and run it, but yeah, it'd be a good idea nonetheless. Okay. So let's let's come back to the idea of fitra and, yeah. and just try to... You know, I think, I've, alhamdulillah, I've got a really good appreciation of this concept uh, today for you. Jazakallah, okay, that's, that's right. really, really great. So um, uh, you touched on this, but uh, fitra, can it give us, uh, can it lead us to conclude that lying is a bad idea, killing is bad? Uh, can we naturally form these judgments about the actions that people undertake. Yeah. So I do think that we have a basic moral sense or intuition as human beings. I think if you look across human history and and human civilization, you do find that things like murder, uh, rape, theft, and so on have almost universally been condemned. So a question that immediately rises is why? Mm. What is it about... Uh, human beings such that they are universally, wherever it may be on the globe, forming these similar moral beliefs. Well, one explanation is that we have a moral sense, a moral capacity to recognize the good and the bad. So, um, yeah, uh, lying, you know, um, I mean, that's a controversial one because some uh, people might think in certain contexts it's okay to lie. Hmm. Others, if you're a Kantian, um, you, you know, you would uh, be likely to think otherwise. But I think on certain fundamental points, as I said, murder, rape, theft, and so on. Uh, How far does that go? I mean, you know, fasting. Yeah. Does one ha- have an incl- inclination towards fasting or towards, yeah? Well, I think fasting is not um, an inclination towards fasting. I don't think that's a moral issue per okay. se. All right. Um, although from a sh- it is uh, from a Sharia perspective, mm. I suppose. But no, I, I don't really know, frankly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when uh, lots of Muslims want to do da'wah, they want to speak to non-Muslims, they want to convince them they have people they know at uh, school and colleges, and some people do this very effectively. You know, they've yeah. got friends and they bring them to, to Islam. Um, how much should we be aware of the discussion about fitra in our discussions with those non-Muslims, because often mm-hmm. we go armed with lots of rational arguments, which are, of course, important, and you've described their importance, especially mm. in the society in which we live. But is there a should we be cognizant of this fitri idea when placing those rational arguments? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think in discussions with people who don't believe in God, I think it you know one way to to go about it is just to reel off a lot of um, rational philosophical arguments. Yeah. But it seems to me that very often it's not those arguments which are pushing them away from um, religious belief. Often 
um, they might have been exposed to, you know, they might have a bad experience with religious folk or with a particular religion. Yeah. There might be some underlying emotional, spiritual reason. So one one way in which you might approach it, as I say, is rational argument. Maybe another way is to think about, and I'm just putting this out there, um, what are the existential or practical benefits of faith? So um, somebody might say, well, um, I have various needs. I have this need for meaning, for cosmic purpose. Mm. I have this desire to be loved, to be protected or something like that. Mm. And belief in God satisfies these desires. Therefore, belief in God is reasonable mm. on, on a practical level for mm -hmm. a person. So I think practical reasons are also relevant here. But the other thing I'd like to say is that when we think about God and 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 the evidence for God, um, one question we might ask is, what would evidence for God look like? Yeah. What's the sort of evidence we should expect from God? And so this is how I look at it. I think that evidence for God would basically satisfy two principles. One, it would be widely accessible to people, mm. human beings of of all backgrounds, of all capacities, of all of capacities. Yeah, right. it's not just for the philosophers. Mm. You know, if we, from a Quranic perspective, God created us to worship Him and hence know Him, mm. and that's human beings and jinn as well um, across the board, yes. right? Yeah. So that's the first thing. There's this wide accessibility thing, and then I would like to say though that. The evidence, although it might be widely accessible, it might in some sense be resistible. Mm. So consider that, you know, if God made evidence of him so overwhelmingly compelling and obvious, it would take away this um, notion of human beings yearning for God, desiring God, finding him and developing this deep interpersonal relationship. Mm. God would already be compelled upon them if his evidence was that obvious. And I think within this domain of resistibility, that's where moral and spiritual um, virtues or vices might be relevant. Mm. So that this longing, desiring, yearning, seeking of God might become very relevant there. And rather than the, say, philosophical acumen. Mm. And so that will be relevant maybe to consider with somebody who doesn't believe. I heard from a, a scholar, and in fact, I think this is shared by a number of uh, uh, Muslims today of a particular persuasion, that when you live in a city, when you live amongst, you know, in a place where there's bricks and mortar and there's concrete buildings, there's, yeah. you know, outside here, we've got the Bank of England up the road, and it's, right. it's pretty, it's just material around us, that we are distanced from our fitra. But when you live in a countryside area, you live in a in a forest, you visit, you know, you, you see the wildlife and animals, you are closer to your fitri self. I mean, is there a, is that, does that chime with your understanding of what fitra is? Well, I mean, the, there's one thing here that um, I think I, it was some time ago that I, I, I caught sight of a video by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Hmm. And, uh, and he was talking about you know, the, the majesty and glory, uh, gloriousness and magnificence of the stars at night, which you get to experience if you're in the desert. Yeah. But you don't experience that because of light pollution in the city. True. And he basically said, um, this is one of the reasons why atheism is, is uh, prevalent. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because yeah. we can't see the stars. Yeah. The point that I think Hamza Yusuf was making is that um, when we're in and amongst the natural world, um, Say, if we think, if God exists and he wants to know us and he's set up um, maybe signs uh, or, or pieces of evidence to uh, bring us close to him, uh, it seems to me that nature might just be the thing because uh, we do seem to have these overwhelmingly like transcendent experiences sometimes in, in nature when we're um, in the country or we're up a mountain or we're looking at the splendor of the horizon and yeah. the starlit night sky. So maybe in those environments, we're closer to um, being in a position to have our theistic disposition to come out, uh, to be manifest. Yes. So maybe that's one way of thinking about it. I mean, you don't have to have a comment on this, but I used to know a guy, a friend of mine who 
used to work in the city and <laughs> he would walk out of his building, his tall building every day and, and see the Mercedes and the cars parked outside. And he'd say, this, this makes me want to believe in God more. And, you know, he, <laughs> I'm not sure how, what, what the connection was, but, you know, he, he seemed to have come to a view that, you know, that the Mercedes, which I suppose it does, right? You know, it, it yeah. does ultimately, but I, I presume you know, a tree would take you there quicker than a car. Probably. You know? Yeah. I think maybe this individual was thinking about, like, it is pretty amazing what human beings can do. Wow, yes. And 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 maybe that is, is the sign there. Wow. That is it really likely that by chance or by accident, human beings have just, um, you know, popped up and have this extraordinary intelligence and capacity and conscious agents are able to make such a thing like a Mercedes car right. without there being a creator or something. Uh, so there I was thinking he's just become a capitalist. <laughs> you've uh, you've uh, explained that to me. Okay, so one last question for you. Um, Stephen Fry says that bone cancer in children is a key argument, is an argument against a merciful creator. I mean, how would you respond to, to Stephen Fry? Yeah. yeah. I remember this viral clip. Yes. Uh, yes. So I think there are roughly like three ways we could, we could approach this. And I think though each of these ways we find within our tradition. So one way, and this is broadly, it seems to me, an Ashari uh, approach within the Kalam tradition, mm. is to just say that moral evaluative judgments made about God are just an anathema. They just are irrelevant, doesn't make sense. Mm. Why? Because they want to say that there is no standard of goodness outside of God, mm. which he has to adhere to um, or by which we judge him. Right. Such that whenever God wills something, that that is good. Given his nature, mm. whatever God wills, that is good, right? So An earthquake or a thunderstorm. Whatever the case may be. Right. So this is, um, in in some sense, a radical position, um, but that would be one approach to just deny this whole idea of uh, there being a standard of goodness outside of God by which we judge him. Mm. Others might not necessarily take that route, and they might think, well, okay, uh, maybe there isn't a standard of goodness outside of God by which we judge him, um, because God is goodness himself, mm. Uh, God is the good, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but given our own understanding of what is good, right? We we have, for instance, we know it's wrong to torture children just for the sake of it, something like that. Yeah. That's clearly evidently wrong. So we, we can have some idea of what a good God would do and what he wouldn't do. Like he wouldn't command that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and so those in this camp, would want to say, well, um, yeah, we can offer um, evaluative judgments about God's actions um, in principle, but when it comes to God's um, God, God permitting evil and suffering in the world, God has certain overriding reasons for allowing it. Mm. There is certain wisdom in the presence of suffering. So a couple of examples. Um, and, and, and I want to note that it, it is difficult uh, when you look at particular instances. It's much easier when you're talking about it in general, mm -hmm. right? So it's very difficult to look at a particular instance and say, well, I know the reason is exactly this, that, and the other. Yeah. But there are more general reasons which can encompass, say, the bone cancer in children, or the, the example that you, you gave. Mm -hmm. So one of them is free, free will, right? So that there is a certain value in humans being endowed with freedom of choice and responsibility. Without that, moral virtues um, that we can acquire as human beings and the good of that, the good of becoming compassionate, empathetic, uh, understanding, patient, loving, is not possible if we don't have free will, right? If we are compelled to act in a certain way, mm -hmm. you can't attribute any goodness or badness to that particular agent because they're just being compelled. Mm. So free will is a great good and, and, and great thing. And unfortunately, <laughs> clearly, um, humans have then the capacity to 
do things that are not good, mm. right? But if you eradicate that, you, you eradicate the capacity to do good and all of the great and valuable things that come with that. Mm. So that's, that's one, one element. And that's um, also related to this idea of soul building or soul making or something like that. Mm. But related to that, and this now touches on the idea of natural evil, evil that comes by way of earthquakes or tsunamis or these natural diseases, is the idea that if God is to give human beings moral choice, freedom and responsibility, because that's a great good, mm -hmm. um, then God can only do so if he sets up the world according to certain natural laws or regularities. So, for instance, if, um, say, we, we know that when, when we, if we uh, put a bullet in the gun and we fire it, uh, then the bullet will, will, will come out, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that because given the nature of guns and bullets, that it follows that regular pattern. Yeah. But suppose there was no regularity and we had no idea whether it's going to shoot, whether it's not going to shoot. In a world like that, uh, it would be very difficult for humans to have moral responsibility over their actions and choices because they wouldn't be able to um, determine the outcome of their, of their actions. Mm. And so it might be the case that God has to, if he wants to achieve this great good of humans having moral choice, freedom and responsibility, um, to become, uh, to acquire these virtues, um, it might be the case that God needs to set the world up according to natural laws and regularities. And it might be that an offshoot of those natural laws and regularities is certain disasters as well. Mm -hmm. And note that those disasters also give opportunities for humans to do great good. If we take the example recently in Turkey, mm. this terrible, disastrous incident. Earthquake, yeah. The earthquake. Yeah. And... Yet there is great good in human striving and all of the virtues that come about with humans responding to that. Now that good is not possible mm -hmm. if there's no earthquake. Yeah. Emotionally, of course, this doesn't do, and I'm not trying to, uh, I would never you know, use this to satisfy somebody's um, own sufferings and so yes. on. Yeah. Uh, they need to be consoled, but intellectually, that's one way to look at it. The third way mm. is the following, and sometimes in, in philosophy of religion, this is called skeptical theism. So, do you know in the Quran, there's a verse in the second chapter in Surah Al-Baqarah um, where uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God tells the angels that he's going to create this khalifa, this representative vicegerent on the earth, the human being. Yeah. Uh, and the angels respond by saying, you know, what will you create uh, that one who will cause bloodshed and corruption on the land. Mm. And God replies and says, I know that which you don't know. Yes. So skeptical theism is the idea that we should be skeptical about what we can reasonably say about God in certain instances. So we know that God in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is um, infinitely good and infinitely wise. Mm. So given his nature, we know he must have a morally sufficient reason for allowing the, the suffering. Maybe it is to do with free will. Maybe it is to do with soul building, soul making, and so on. But even if God does have a reason, why should we think that we'd know about it? Yes. Why should we think that we would have access to those reasons? Yeah. Because God is, you know, um, Soren Kierkegaard, the famous existentialist Danish philosopher said, there is an infinite qualitative difference between humans and God. Mm. So why think we as limited human beings would have access to God's reasons? And so, um, yeah, we could rest content. And I think this is where virtues like tawakkul Allah and trust in God come that we know God is good. We know he's fully wise. So he must have a reason. Mm. Why think I'd know it? Amy Turner, it's been fascinating. And it's, uh, you've allowed this Wolfenstein boy to understand a quite a complex subject in an easy way. So I thank you very much for that. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Oh, yeah. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkingmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.